it's time to, to go to the next presenter that is actually me. So I'm going to share my screen. And you see it. Okay, perfect. So well, for this part of the training, we will be focusing now on horticultural basics of planting a new citrus tree in the backyard. Okay, and how a homeowner can be successful on this task of planting and growing a, a, a citrus tree in, in their backyard? Well, for this, we will need a good a site selection and proper planting and then proper irrigation and nutrition. Then adequate tree care and of course, take care of pests and diseases. Doing that will help us to have a good looking tree like these ones that you can see here uh, with harvestable fruit that we can actually eat. Uh, and during this presentation and the next presentations that will happen this morning, we will be addressing all of these uh, uh, topics that I just showcased here. Because you know, as well as I do, that most of the concerns that homeowners have are related to these questions. Uh, so how do I plant and take care of my trees? How can I identify and treat diseases? How can I scout and manage pests? And very importantly, will I be able to harvest with fruit that we can eat at home? So for starters, let's say that foundation to success starts with a good healthy tree. So the first, the first advice that we need to, to, to convey to homeowners is purchase trees from reliable sources. This is mainly from a certified nursery that produces clean plant material. And here is what a label looks like and the information that this label may, must, must contain actually. And that includes the nursery name, the registration number, the tree variety and the roost block. Okay, this is really paramount. So now we have our tree, now what? Where do we plant it? Uh, in general, a sunny spot is, is, is good, but we know that citrus is shade tolerant. And in some cases of light shade, we see that trees, that, uh, trees do much better. Also, if possible, always look for the south side of the house and try to leave at least 15 feet between trees of distance and, and also from constructions, especially if we are planting a vigorous variety, for instance, sugar bell. Sugar bell is really vigorous and, and we need that, that space. Then also common sense dictate to choose a, a spot far from structures like septic tanks or drainage. And we need also to prepare the site by removing any weeds or previous plant material. And also, as we, as we have been saying before, uh, we should avoid, in, we should avoid uh, planting in a spot with high soil pH, as trees do not perform well on high uh, pH. Ideally, our soil pH should be around 6 to 6.5. So it is always recommended to, to check soil for, for pH values. Now we need to plant the tree and for doing that, obviously we need to dig a hole. Uh, that's obvious, but now the hole should only be as deep as the tree's root ball or the root ball should be slightly above the soil line. Now we need, when we remove the, the, the tree from the, from, the plot, from the pot, we need to check the root ball from, for, for some root boundaries. And if that happened, if needed, we can prune the roots actually. In any case, we will not plant the tree deeper than it was in the pot. 
and we will feed the remaining area with uh, some native soil from the area that, that we are planting the tree. We can plant any time of the year in Florida, but in general, the best time to plant citrus trees is spring or early fall. And then it's really important and recommendable to protect the newly planted trees, especially protecting the trees from these guys that, that you already probably know, the Asian citrus psyllid, that as you know, is the vector of the bacteria that is associated with the greening disease or HLB. Now, one of the best ways we can protect our trees at home is by using individual protective covers. You may have seen these covers all around the state in commercial groves as, as they are gaining popularity among growers. We have shown already that they prevent exposure of trees to psyllids and also they are environmentally friendly as the use of insecticides can be reduced. The mode of action is really simple. It's based on psyllid exclusion as the holes of the, of the mesh are smaller than the psyllid's body so they cannot trespass this barrier and they don't infect our trees. Now, I said you can see You can see these IPCs more and more in commercial groves, but also in demonstration groves. And as an example here, you can see how the citrus grove at the Henry Ford Estates in Fort Myers looks at this moment after we helped them in revitalizing this historical citrus grove. As a fun fact, they decorate the IPCs in Christmas and also in Halloween, as you can imagine, these make really good ghosts when the time comes. Now, this is, this is a good detail of what you can achieve by protecting the trees with, with the IPCs. And you can note the differences in leaf, leaf aspect when you compare protected versus non-protected uh, trees. You can see how the leaves are totally different. For more in-depth information about this system, I'm happy to say that we just recently published an edits document that you can read and look into details on the things like installation, effects of on, on tree growth, uh, other pests of concern, et cetera. There's, there's a lot of uh, practical information in this document about how to use these this, uh, individual protective covers. Now, we have our tree already planted and we will need to take care of it uh, in the future. Now, David, David Kadiapakeni will be talking in depth about irrigation and nutrition, but to give you some detail on how to start once we have planted the tree, let's say that at the beginning, we will need to water twice per week from March to June in general. One, to two gallons each time. And after that, we will water when needed. And regarding fertilization, just very basic uh, uh, details, just begin after three weeks of planting with an 888 formula for MPK and apply that in circle around the tree about one and a half cups, and then increase the amount at the tree grows. And as I tell you, uh, David will be, will be giving you more in-depth details on, on how to take care of the trees uh, after, after we have planted them. Now we have our tree growing and we want it, of course, to produce, to produce fruit. So I would like to, to introduce now a concept that is important and is branch orientation. In general, in a tree, you can see that we have vertical branches that they tend to be vigorous and produce almost no fruit. Then we have some lower branches that tend to be weaker and produce low uh, quality fruit. Now it is horizontal middle branches, the ones that will be producing the most fruit and the best quality fruit. 
So we want our trees actually to have good lateral branches. And as an example of what I just said, here you can see a sugar bell tree. This is about five year old tree uh, located here in, in, in my research center in Imokali in Southwest Florida. And this, you can see here how vertical vigorous branches are growing upwards and they don't have fruit on them. And how most of the production is located in horizontal middle branches. So we can see here a clear example of how architecture, tree architecture is, is important for, for fruit production. And what she, one, one way to, to, to shape tree architecture actually and, and achieve good fruit results is by doing some pruning. Now, pruning is a specialized practice that I like to say always that mixes uh, science and art and can be complicated, but for a homeowner standpoint, we can stick to some very basics that will help our trees to produce better fruit. So for instance, something easy to do and that always pays back is removing suckers or water sprouts for, from the base of the tree. This is something that we really need to do always. And these suckers or water sprouts usually come from the rootstock. You can see them here where the red arrow is. Okay. Uh, we need to remove those as soon as they appear. And they are easy to identify as they are green and tender and they grow upright and fast. And also we can remove all, always a water sprouts from horizontal producing branches because these suckers uh, are vegetative tissue going upwards and, re and what they do is to divert resources from the limbs that will produce the fruit, which is actually in this area here. So we need to remove this, 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 this type of, of tender upright uh, branches. So in general, what we want in, in our tree is uh, to have three or four scaffold branches. Usually when you buy a, 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 a tree from a, from a, from a store box or, or directly from a nursery in, in, a, in a 30 gallon pot, uh, you have this conformation already. So you have already three to four scaffold branches and we are selecting those and we will need to remove, as I told you, the greener upright vertical branches that I just mentioned, and also any internal weak branch that are marked here as, as these. So they will not produce any fruit and they will be uh, diverting resources actually from uh, the, the branches that we are marking as, as C which are the branches that will be producing uh, the fruit. So those, when the tree grows, uh, we, we may want them to head back a little bit. So the tree is forced to produce more lateral branches and there, there is more potential for producing fruit. But we will not do that until the three is about three years old. If we do that before, we will be a promoting vegetative a growth and the tree will produce, there will be a delay in the production of, of, of fruit. So, so between we plant the tree and, and we, we start to do this pruning, at least we, we should be be spending, we, we should be waiting about three years. And at that time, the, the, the tree will start producing fruit. So in this period of three years, the only thing that we will do is just remove the, the, the water sprouts and, and suckers from the, from the lateral branches and also from the, from the, from the rootstock. Okay, also remove uh, any dead wood that 
can be done from the very beginning because that can be a, 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 a potential source for, for disease in, in our tree. So after three years, actually, what we can do annually is, is a little light pruning uh, and always after freezing risk has passed. Also, we can do some skirting after these three, three years if we have some limbs that are too close to the ground and, and that can have a fruit touching the ground, that, that is not good. And never, never prune any large portions of the canopy. Now, it's also important that we have our pruning tools always clean. And for this, we can use a solution of bleach, a uh, 3%, and we need to clean the tools every time that we start pruning. And then if we have more than one tree, from tree to tree, and then avoid the tools to get in contact with the soil. It is also important, this is, I will stress out this, uh, very important to prune in the dry season because fresh cuts can get contaminated easily in wet conditions, so if we have rains. So the best time for pruning is, is actually after we harvest and, and all, the, uh, all, the, all the freezing uh, risk has passed and we are not yet in the wet season. So it's about, it's about February probably, January, February, more late February in general, that's the best time for, for pruning. So with this, this is the, the summary for, for my presentation with some take home messages. First and, and foremost, carefully choose the scion and the rootstock. And for that matter, as we have heard today already, your FIFAS breeding program selections are excellent choices. Also carefully choose the planting site and avoid, if possible, high pH areas. And ideal pH, as I mentioned before, will be between 6 and 6.5. And the best time for planting citrus in our backyard is spring or early fall. Also consider the use of IPCs for tree protection against psyllids and HLB infection during, at least during the first couple of years. And finally, a water sprout removal is essential to ensure better tree growth and productivity down the road as the tree grows. And that is all that I, that I wanted to, to present today. And I will an, answer any questions. Thank you. So if you want to pop your questions into the chat box, um, we will ask Dr. Alvarez. And Dr. Alvarez, I have to ask if you um, drew the beautiful picture of the pruning graphic yourself. No, that's no, that's 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 from a from an old friend. No, okay. it's, it's not it's mine. Very helpful. Very helpful to see that. Yeah, Caesar says great pruning graphic as well. We really appreciate that. Um, Oh, uh, Anna Redondo wants to know uh, how easy is it to find IPC in uh, in stores? You know, if we're recommending it to homeowners, um, how can we find the those IPC bags? Uh, right now, I don't think that they are that they are selling in stores, but I'm sure that if the if the if the demand grows. Uh, we will be able to find them in stores. So I can I can also address that. So um, in one of our partnerships in putting trees out in extension demonstration gardens, we are being supported by the company Tree Defender, and we'll be sharing some IPCs um, to our demonstration garden partners. So I will be reaching out to them and asking them about are they open to getting those from um for, for consumers as well so um a lot of this is very new to some of our commercial um partners in this regard and so um i think that they will be open to it because it should be a new source of revenue for them but 
we, we need to kind of bring them along as well. So, right. But it's a little bit of putting the cart before the horse, but it's, this is kind of how the change is going to happen, right? Exactly. And so um, that's why, again, I go back to why it's very strategic and very intentional that we are working with horde agents in extension. I mean, we have this wonderful network. And so we need to bank on that. We need to leverage that. So um, that's a great thing for us to follow up on. So thank you for sharing that question, Anna. Okay, so uh, from Hillsborough County, um, what, what would you recommend lowering the soil pH with um, Dr. Alvarez if we needed to do a soil amendment to get that pH down? That's a good question. And, and, and I know that some of the some of the fertilizers that are in the in the in the market now, especially those that are uh, that are rich in, in sulfur, can help with that. I'm sure that maybe later we'll, we'll address that in more detail. And again, uh, commercial growers are, are, are doing things that are out of the scope or of uh, homeowners like acidifying the, the, the irrigation water. That's out of the scope for a, for a homeowner. So at the end, the, a long-term solution will be a, a, a rootstock that is tolerant. But but by now, as I tell you, and, and I'm sure that maybe later we'll address that in more detail, uh, some fertilizers can, can help with that. Okay, and then uh, Manji um, says, um, watering twice a week may not be enough because of our sandy soil and reduced root system. So- um, Yes, I agree with that. And as I, as I mentioned, I, I, uh, I mentioned uh, twice per week, but also uh, as needed. I mean, if you see that the tree is wilting, you can you can you can add more water. That's for sure. Even though you have already already watered twice, if if it's not enough, you will see it in the in the leaves. If the leaves are wilting, uh, and and right. we call that epinastic. <laughs> you know that when they when they get when they get like like this, look my mask. So this will be a, a really turgent leaf if we do it like this, or you cannot see, okay, like this. So, oh, it's disappearing. Okay, now we call this epinastic when, when it turn when it falls. So when it falls, it means that, that, it, it, that the tree needs water, then you can, you can water it. Okay, and then another uh, comment, Susan Griffin from Polk County mentions that Amazon business, not sure about regular Amazon, has IPC type mesh bags um, for sale already. Wendy, I want to pop in on that. I would be very, sorry, this is Lauren. I would be very careful what you purchase online. There's a huge variety in quality of bags such that they might rip within a few weeks. Um, remember, we have thorny citrus plants. Also, there's a variation in mesh size. So Fernando said you have to have a 50 gram mesh to keep psyllids out. Yeah. Um, if you have too big of a mesh size, they go right through. That's really important point, Lauren. Thank you. Yes, uh, don't trust <laughs> don't trust this kind of sources. I mean, it is important that the that the mesh size is is smaller than the psyllid. If not, it's even worse. Right. Because the psyllids can get in, and nothing else can get in. So. Okay, well, thank you very much. That's, that's it for the questions now. The other ones will be covered. So thank you. Uh, so I think we can we can start with the with the next presentation that will be uh, Dr. David Kadian Pakeni, who is a, a soil and water scientist. Can I interrupt for just a minute, there, sure. Wendy? I think there was one question about pruning, and did we answer that one about more information and eat us about pruning? And I wanted to ask our oh, faculty: yes. um, Do we have any other additional sources, or do we need to follow up on that? Okay. Um, yeah, so the question was, is there more information on um, pruning on uh, Ask IFAS right now? And yes. um, 
there's some, but I would say that Dr. Alvarez's diagram and description were probably the more the most uh, comprehensive on pruning citrus that I've seen in a long, long time. So maybe Dr. Alvarez could turn that into a nice EDIS document for us. Uh, yes, that is that is uh, actually a pretty new document uh, that that is in 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 Ask IFAS and and and. And is more related to, to commercial pruning, but 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 can be adapted. And and one of the things that we are doing in this initiative is, is to adapt uh, several uh, EDES documents also to the to the to the homeowner uh, perspective. So so we are going to be working also on 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 putting together some of these documents, including including a. Uh, pruning for, for, for homeowners. And then uh, we have another follow-up question. Um, what about um, pruning larger trees? Should that also be done during the dry season? Yes, pruning uh, is recommended to do it always do, during the dry season because, because any, any rain or wet environment is conducive for, for mold growth, uh, more diseases, so it is always recommended to, to prune during the, the dry season, yeah. And uh, for larger trees, the um, EDIS documents that we have with our fertilizer recommendations, are those still the same? Uh, yes, but as I, as I told you, probably Davey is going to address that in, in his presentation now. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you.